<clears throat> Hello to everybody out there in Periscope land. This is Brother Ed and welcome to KJV Bible Scope and we're going to continue on with our um, little sermon. I think we're kind of closing up with this. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. And we are, if I'm correct, we're on a part six. Hey, how's it going there, Des? Um, yeah, we're we're just kind of in this. Um, I don't know if Legends, uh, Legends, did you join? Is Legends on here? I was kind of hoping Legends would get back on. We were kind of going through this 2 Corinthians 11. I guess just for Legends, I'll just continue on. Maybe he'll watch the replay. So, so here it goes. But I fear least by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So, um, what we have is the serpent beguiling Eve. So, you see the word beguiled there. Oh, there he is. There he is. How's it going, legends? Um, just waiting for you to get back on. Um, so, we have this beguiling of Eve. You see that? And so our minds are corrupted the same way Eve's mind was corrupted and beguiled by the serpent. And the serpent blinds the minds of them which believe not. So, so that's how he's corrupted our minds. And so it's too good to be true or nothing comes for free is in our, in our brains. We're like, we got to do something to obtain it and to maintain it. Otherwise, you know... It, it, can't, it just can't be, logically. It just can't be. There's no way that Christ can just save me and that's it. It's too, it that's, that's too simple. <laughs> Guys, uh, I mean, we got verses like this all over the Bible. It's just, it's crazy. I mean, for somebody to say that you have to, to maintain it by holiness or righteousness, it's, 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 it's completely absurd, man. It, it, it violates so many scriptures because it's not simple then you're like well, well the holy spirit will help you keep it no no because my flesh is still warring every day H how do you deal with the war that's not simple you tell me the war's simple well, well you, you know you just simply obey the spirit well that's not what Romans 7 tells me Romans 7 tells me it, it's not me but sin that dwelleth in me see see guys i mean you, there's so many verses that are violated in the Bible, and I, 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 you don't even know where to begin with so many scriptures that you have that violate this righteous living. Now, now you get you want to get down this road on this righteous living. You know what the problem is you can't answer Hebrews 11. You just got to stay away from Hebrews 11 because there's a bunch of people in there that didn't do any righteous living, and you just got to avoid it. You just got to say, well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to believe that. You got to avoid 1 John chapter 1 because they, th those holiness guys always say, well, well, you know, they all go. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're supposed to live upright, but if I don't live upright, I'm not going to go to hell. That's, that's the argument. <laughs> that's the argument, Des. That's, it's that in a nutshell. Yeah, absolutely called to live upright. I mean, holy. Well, to live holy. Be holy for I'm holy. But, th but that doesn't save you. That's, see, that's the point. And what people keep trying to do is keep hanging hellfire over you, saying if you don't do it, you're going to go to hell. I don't read that anywhere in the Bible. And it's just crazy. Yeah, sanctification is a process. Salvation is something that happens instantaneously. So once you're saved, bam, you're saved. So sanctification is a process. And so sanctification does adds no merit to your salvation at all, period. So it doesn't, so, so if I fail in sanctification, I'm still saved. That's the point. That's the point I'm trying to make. Now, is sanctification important? Yes, it's very important. But the sanctification, is it so important that it sa keeps me saved? No, it doesn't. That's to decide whether I've trusted Jesus or not. That's what the test is. It isn't, well, okay, tomorrow I've sinned, and now I got a test to see if I'm really believing in Jesus. Okay, okay, good. I'm glad. Because <laughs> I'm trying to think where you could go with that if, if, if somebody did believe that that was some kind of maintaining some standard. And I'm trying to get there, Des, but sometimes you throw me off. There's so many angles to look at some things, you know, so th thanks for bearing with me on that. So, um, 
So, but the point being is that um, I I always hit Hebrews eleven whenever somebody challenges um, once saved always saved or or I don't really like using that term. You guys know that I I always use eternal security, but that's what it is. It's once saved always saved. I'm saved forever, no matter if I sin willingly or not. But the problem is people want to use a willingful kind of a of a of a thing and then they, then they want to incorporate that into the Bible somewhere to make it look like okay yeah you you've got to live some kind of holy life or you're going to lose it and it's like and 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 what what he's trying to do is he's trying to say well you can't just say Jesus saved you and that's it and my argument is yes you can you can if you've truly trusted in Christ yes you can the problem is, the problem with that is your motives i wouldn't know if you're saved and the person Mr. Holiness man ain't going to know if you're saved. The only person that's really going to know is you and God. And so if he wants to live a carnal life for the rest of his life, he's able to do that. That's just his bearing on his relationship to God, having a dead relationship with God. It has no bearing on his salvation. The problem is people draw back. They draw back when they hear stuff like that. And they're like, no, no, I don't, I don't believe the Bible teaches that. And all I'm saying is the Bible doesn't teach for you to get saved and then live an unholy life. But the problem with that is if you did live an unholy life, it wouldn't mean you lost your salvation. But the Bible always promotes for you to live a righteous life because that's why he saved you. He saved you so you would live a righteous life. Right, right, legends. Because uh, when you're dealing with the tree that, that's burned, that's dealing with the nation of Israel, and people don't like rightly dividing the Bible in those contexts, like John 15 and so forth, when you're dealing with the tree, when you go to Romans and you're dealing with the tree, you know, and they're grafted in and all that, they don't, they don't want that to be Israel. They want that to be the church. And see, you don't, guys, you don't understand. God has a, God has a wife, okay? Jesus has a bride, are, come on, guys. Are we there yet? God has a wife, and he's divorced his wife. So you say, well, see, he divorced his wife because she wasn't faithful to him. So, so you know, you got to be faithful to God in order for God to maintain your salvation, because if you're not faithful to God, he won't maintain your salvation for you. Okay, the problem with that, guys, divorced Israel, what are you going to do about when he took Israel back? Think about that one. He took Israel back off of no merit of their own. What are you going to do with that? You just skip it? You just say, God divorced Israel. I'm not going to read the rest of the Bible and find out that God took Israel back and they were his wife. Let's just, let's just skip that. And no, guys. No, guys. You guys ever read Hosea? You guys ever read Hosea? Hosea's wife was unfaithful to him the whole time. And God just showed right, right legends. She was unfaithful the whole time. And God was, God was using Hosea as an example for the nation of Israel. Right, right. He's using Hosea. And, and she was so unfaithful to him. She was so unfaithful to him. And what, and what did Hosea do? He took her back. And you know what? That's an example of what God does to Israel, even though Israel was not faithful to, to, to their God. God still took them, God still took them back. And you're going to use that as an example. Well, if you're not faithful to God, he's going to, you know, he's going to divorce you. That's bad example. Bad example. Learn the Bible if that's your example. Amen, legends. Amen. Yeah. It's, it's amazing what people pull out of the Bible and they twist. Guys, they were unfaithful. You know what they had to do? They had to trust in God's faithfulness. And guys, you know what we're doing today? We're not trusting in our faithfulness. We're trusting in God's faithfulness. No, no, it's not you. No, it's not your righteousness. No, it's nothing about you. Now, when you understand that it's God, guess what happens? Maybe one day when you still really start realizing that it's God that really loves you and he's keeping your salvation for you and he just wants you to love him because he wants you to love him, not because he's holding hellfire over you, then maybe one day you'll understand that, hey, wait a minute, my wife doesn't make me love her because if I don't love her, she's going to, she's going to, you know, stab me with a spear in my side. No, my wife wants me to love her because I, I can love her or I cannot love her. 
but nothing bad's going to happen to me if I don't love her. She, she'll, she might leave me. Guys, I'm not going to die. She's not going to kill me. Maybe. No. No, you don't believe it? Okay, guys. Let's, okay. The church. The, Jesus Christ has the bride, the church. And you know what? A lot of the church is unfaithful. A lot of the church is unfaithful. It's no different from it's no different from Israel. So so okay, what you're telling me is if if I'm faithful to God and I don't sin anymore, and I'm so faithful to God that God's gonna God's just gonna God's gonna keep me preserved, right? Is that what you're saying? So so Israel is going to hell because where were they faithful? Where were they faithful? God takes Israel back and he casts Israel into hell. Is that what you're saying? Then Ezekiel 37 makes no sense. Throw it in the trash. Uh, Zechariah 12 doesn't make sense. Throw it in the trash. I, um, Isaiah 60, was it 64, 65, 66? Doesn't make sense. Throw it in the trash. We don't need that because it goes against our false doctrine. Oh, guys, 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 people try anything to make it look like you can lose your salvation. They will twist up scripture. And the problem is, guys, there's so much scripture supporting eternal security. It, it blows my mind. What do you do about the nation of Israel, guys, who was out in the wilderness? They kept sinning against God, sinning against God, sinning against God. And then he still calls them faithful. He still. All right, let's do this. All right, give me a sec. Okay, I want to hit, hold on, let me, hold on, I want to hit this one. And let me, let me clone this. I'm just going to put this to the side for a sec. And um, I'm going to, I'm cross-referencing this one, this one with this one. Hold on. Okay, here it is. Okay. Did did for, first before we get before we hit these. Did Israel sin against God? Did did they mess up bad with God? They did. They messed up bad. Right? They were unfaithful. They served other gods. They, they, remember when they went to, to, um, Mount Sinai, they made that golden calf. You guys remember that? The golden calf meltdown. Yeah. Yeah. Bad news. Bad news. You guys ready for this? Numbers 23, 21. Look, behold, I have received commandment to bless and he had blessed and I cannot reverse it. Now look. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Are you serious? Neither he hath he seen perverseness in Israel. Are you serious? The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of the king is among them. He's not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Mr. Holiness, guys, answer that. Answer that. How does he not behold any iniquity in Jacob when all Jacob did was do iniquity? How did he hold no perverseness? He says, I have beheld no perverseness in Israel and there was nothing but perverseness. The holiness guys kind of stay off my periscope because um, there's too many verses you got to deal with. All right. Isaiah 27, 9, by this, therefore, shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged. And this is all the fruit to take away his sin. And when he maketh all the stones of the altar as chalk stones that are beaten in sunder, the groves and images shall not stand up. There's a coming a time when God's going to forgive the whole nation of Israel for all the wrong they've done. Israel's not even, Israel's not even alive right now. 
That doesn't happen until Ezekiel 37 when he, he puts life into them, breathes into them life. Right, the Jews. Um, every, you know, the Israel, the, the whole Israelite, all the tribes of Israel. They don't have life yet because God's going to bring them back into their land. And that's not happening right now, guys. People think this is all prophecy fulfilled right now. What's going on there right now? That's not it. No, th no, that's not it. No, they're not saved no matter what. The ones that the ones that died not believing by grace through faith, they went to hell. They went to hell. Okay, guys, do you do you guys remember Judas? He went to hell. He's a Jew. Pharisees were threatened by Jesus Christ. They were Jews. He said, how shall ye escape the damnation of hell? Yeah, um, the, the rich man in hell right now, he's a Jew. The thief that died on the cross on the other side of Jesus, not the one that believed, I'm talking about the one on the other side, he was a Jew, and he ended up going to hell. Yeah, that's scripture. Read it. Go, go Luke 23. Go Luke 23, go to, go to Luke, look, what we'll Luke 16. All I really need is Luke 16, really. So we'll, we'll go to Luke 16, and I'll show you that this rich man is a Jew. And this will, this will defeat anybody that thinks that all Jews are saved. Let's do it. Come on, clear up. Thank you. There we go. Let's go down to our account here. Let's see here. Here we, here we, here we go. Luke 16, 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at the, his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass when the beggar died and was carried by the angels into where? Abraham's bosom. So, no, the, the paradise isn't called Abraham's bosom. They actually brought him to Abraham. And so he's hugging him in his bosom. See that? Kind of like John hugging Jesus in his bosom, okay? So Abraham's bosom is not a place it's a person and he has a bosom. <laughs> the rich man also died and was buried. Now look, in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. See, he's hugging, he's hugging Abraham. No, this is New Testament. This is Luke 16. Yes, yeah, so this is, Jesus Christ is telling this, this story here. It's an actual account. So this is not a parable. This is a, a real account. And he cried and said, Father Abraham. Now, 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 now look. No, oh, 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 you mean Abraham. Yes, it is Abraham from the Old Testament. I didn't understand your question there, legend. Sorry about that. Yeah, it is Abraham. Yeah, it is Abraham from the Old Testament, right. Now, he's the father of all them that believe. If you remember in Romans chapter 4, he's the father of all them that believe. So where did he go? He went to paradise. And guess where Lazarus went? Lazarus went to paradise with Abraham. And Lazarus was comforted because he was in Abraham's bosom, hugging him, right? Remember? We just read that. Now, now, now look, look, look what happens here. In hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off. Now, that's the rich man, right? And, and the rich man saw Lazarus in his bosom. And the rich man, see that he there? And the rich man cried and said, Right. And this is, def this is probably another Lazarus. Uh, 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 it's, it's definitely another Lazarus. Right, right. Yeah, there's more than one Lazarus in the Bible, definitely. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Now, who but a Jew cries Father Abraham? All right, I, I, I'm just saying that's the only people that call Abraham father are Jews. He cried 
That's the rich man. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, son, remember thou, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. See, so Lazarus is comforted. See that? And he was in his bosom, that he was hugging him in his bosom, so he was comforted, but this rich man had nobody to comfort him. And beside all this, between us and you, there's a great goal fixed, so that they which would pass from hence you can, you, to you cannot, neither can they pass to us, that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father. Now, look, he does it again. Nobody would call Abraham father, but a Jew. That thou would ascend him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. Now here's your next key, that, that they're Jews. Who but a Jew believes in the Moses and the prophets? All right, I'm just... All right, you see that? So Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, nay, Father Abraham. So he calls him Father Abraham again. Now, his brethren hears Moses and the prophets. <laughs> yeah, I know, Legends. There's a lot of weird beliefs about Abraham's bosom. But if you notice that he's comforted, no, notice, see, look. But now he is comforted. Now, why was, how was Lazarus comforted? Well, he was hugging him in his bosom. That's why he was in Abraham's bosom. He was hugging him. He was being comforted. When he was on earth, he wasn't comforted, but now he's comforted. Amen there, legends. So, so hopefully you can see this. Now, 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 now look at this. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, now, who but a Jew has Moses and the prophets? Neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So, absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt in your mind, this rich man is a Jew. His brothers would hear Moses and the prophets. So, who, who preaches Moses and the prophets but Jews to one another? We're still dealing with... Right, we're still dealing with the advent of Jesus. He's still on earth. He's the one telling the, he's one telling, not, not the parable, but the actual account of what actually happened. Because the, the, how you tell the difference between a parable and an actual account is parables don't have names in them. An actual account has names. So there was a, Abraham is real. Abraham is, is right. And then you have, um, the rich man's name isn't even mentioned because the Bible says, that um, he's not even going to remember your name. Your name is blotted out of the book of life. So you notice that it's consistent with scripture that his name isn't even mentioned. Right. So yeah, he's not even written in the book of life. So his name is blotted out, obviously. And then um, I think, what's the other one I was going to give? Um, yeah, that's all I can remember off the top of my head right now. So, um, but yeah, so you can see that Jews go to hell. Jews, Jews do go to hell. Now, I'm not saying that all Jews go to hell. I'm saying Jews do go to hell, just like Gentiles go to hell. And what they need to do is, whether you're Jew or Gentile, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because the only reason why they're chosen was because God chose them to be a priesthood nation so they could send light to the Gentiles. They were supposed to be, what does a priest do? What does a priest do? He ministers to people. What does a priesthood nation do? It's not that they're righteous and everybody else is going to hell. The priesthood nation is supposed to minister the truth of God to the whole world. That's what the priesthood nation is supposed to do. But they failed miserably. You can see that all throughout the Bible. Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witness preached there's no hell. Right. Yeah, they call it soul sleep and all that. Right. Yeah. Um. um I'll give you one. I'll give you one really quick that I normally give them about that particular doctrine. Um, let's see if I can remember. Psalm 16. Let me see. 
Okay, here, here it is. Here it is. Now, there's some cross references to this. Now, I'll show you this this one first. Come on, clear up. There we go. All right. That beats moving my camera back and forth. Okay. Verse 9. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now, they're going to use this passage to show that David's soul was not left in hell. That's what Jehovah's Witnesses are going to use. They'll use that to prove that, see, nobody stays in hell, and hell is, isn't really hell anyways, it's soul sleep. But you will not be left in hell, neither will suffer the holy one to see corruption. So see, nobody goes to hell, and, and if you do, you'll get out. See that? Now, the problem with that is, is that that's not what it's talking about. This is, okay, this is the book of Psalms, and David, remember David? David's the one writing this. Now, I want to show you something in Acts 2 concerning this verse. Let me, I'm, I'm trying to find it. Hold on. Right here. Right here. Now, now, now look. He, this is, this is uh, Peter, Peter preaching right here. Ye men of Israel, hear the words of Jesus Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Now look, here's here's the, our verse in Psalm 16. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because... Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now look, thou hast made known unto me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. Now look, here, look, here he's talking about it. Peter's talking it right here. That, that, that verse we just read right there. Now he's about to explain it right here. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. And the sepulcher is with us until this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn an oath unto him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up who? Christ to sit on the throne. Now look, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that what? There's your Psalms passage right there. That his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. And look, this Jesus hath God raised up whereof we are witnesses. So that Psalm passage isn't dealing with David. It's dealing with Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a prophecy of Jesus Christ. And they'll take that and they'll tell you that that's concerning David and that David got out, so we're going to get out. Nobody's going to hell, soul sleep. So hopefully I answered your question on that one. Um, that was just one of one, one of the one of the many that Jehovah Witnesses wrongly divide in the Bible. And so, uh, let me legends. Let me give you an answer to your question last time. I now have an answer for your question. In Acts chapter nine verse seven, cross reference with Acts twenty two nine, where you said that the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice. And then Acts 22, 9, they heard not the voice. You, you remember that one? You remember that one? You said the Jehovah Witnesses gave you this as a, as a contradiction? Yeah, I, I went and looked that up uh, on some of my, my prior notes in Bible school, and I found some notes on that, and I actually wrote it in my sword searcher here. So this, this is pretty good. Let me, let, me get the Acts 20, uh, let me get the Acts 9, 7 real quick. Okay, here, here it is. 
Now, I'm going to flip the string. I'll just show you how I, how I wrote it in here so you can see it. Um, these are these, This is just a, a commentary note that I've made in there. Let me let this clear up a little bit. There we go. Okay, here we go. So, here it is. Acts 9, 7. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And then Acts 22, 9, and that they were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. So this is what I got out of that. In Acts 9, 7, they heard a voice. It just wasn't the voice of him who spake unto Paul. So you see that? Pretty simple. They heard a voice, but it wasn't the same voice that, that Paul heard. <laughs> How about that one? Just... It, it, I, I just never thought it to be that easy to answer. I just, you always think there's there's got to be some deep truth there, but it's pretty much it. They heard a voice. It just wasn't the voice that Paul heard. All right, so, so hopefully you got that. But yeah, I wanted to give you an answer for that. That's the answer. Um, so, all right, so now... We're going to hit this one, and then I'm going to end this scope here, guys. I'm going to hit one more. 1 Corinthians 9.16. Remember, my topic was, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. And what verse does that come out of? Does anybody know? That's my, uh, my trivia question tonight. Does anybody know what that comes out of? What verse that is? What cross or what verse, um, book and chapter and verse? No? Nobody knows? Okay. 1 Corinthians 9.16. Here we go. Clear that up. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For, necess for necessity is laid upon me, Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Now look at verse 17. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel... I, make the, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. You guys see that? What are we dealing with? Well, first of all, there's a necessity. See the necessity there? And it's laid upon me. My question to you and my question to me is, do we have a necessity to preach the gospel? It's a need. And only few people are doing that out in the world today. Few saved people are preach, preaching the gospel. And we as saved members of the body of Christ have a necessity. Not just Paul has a necessity, but we should all have a necessity laid upon us. Now, now when is the last time you ever said, woe was unto me if I preach not the gospel? Now, that's the, our attitude. Amen, Des. That's our attitude to have, guys. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. And if, I'm, if I've sat at home for, for, for you no know, two or three years and having never preached the gospel, I need to ask myself this question. If I, am I hardened to people out in the world that are dying and going to hell every day? Am I hardened to those people? I need to tell them what Jesus Christ has did for them so they could be saved from their sins. But look, guys. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. See, I, I, I do it. But I'm not, guys, whenever you do something, you shouldn't do it to get a reward. Now, we do know when we do this thing willingly, we do have a reward. But that's not why you should do it. Okay, guys? We, we're, we're not, guys, this is love. This is our relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, yes, you do get a reward when you do something willingly for God. But that's not why we do it. Hopefully that's clear, guys. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. 
Now, now this is the problem, guys. People think that this right here, okay, okay, what they'll do is they'll read this part and they'll say, well, if I do it willingly, now look, this right here is the consequence. Now, what they do is they read this part and then they say, this is the consequence. It's not. That's not the consequence, guys. But if against my will, he, he's adding to this, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. He's including it. He's saying, wait a minute, real, real, real quick, real quick. What is a dispensation? You, you guys ever heard of a dispenser? How about a Pez dispenser? You guys ever had one of those Pez dispensers? And when you open it up, it dispenses Pezes out of it? That's, 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 a disp that's dispensation. It's a dispenser. So God is dispensing things for us, for human beings. So he's dispensing it out. But he doesn't dispense it and then take it back. Okay, and you got to understand that, okay? So there is a dispensation of the gospel that's given. Not just for Paul, but for we're now in the dispensation of the gospel of grace. So this dispensation is committed not only to Paul, but unto us. So we need to know that. There, we now have a, a, God has dispensed this thing to us. And now we need to do this, not just to receive a reward, but because our relationship with God and our relationship to the world should be God reaching out through us to the world to reach people for Jesus Christ. How's the Holy Spirit work? He works through us, the church. Guys, if you're not telling anybody about Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit can't reprove, rebuke. The Holy Spirit can't, can't um, do the John 16, 8. Right. See, see, people think that so, the Holy Spirit's just out there and he's just floating around like this. And then he just kind of comes down and just swoops down and goes into somebody. It's like, oh man, I need to get saved. No, that's, that's not it, guys. You know what it is? The church. It's practical. The church goes out to the street opens their mouth. Faith cometh by what? Hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. How does the Holy Spirit work? Through the word of God. If somebody doesn't hear the word of God, how are they, how are they going to get pricked in their heart? Think about it. There's no miraculous thing there. I mean, it's miraculous that we're preaching the word of God. Amen. And when somebody gets saved, it is a miracle. It, that's a miracle from God. But guys, don't make this all mysticism, okay? People get so deep into this mysticism thing, like the Holy Spirit, you know, just, oh, oh, did you feel that? That's the Holy Spirit. No, guys, no, no, no. Don't get charismatic on me, okay? And, and, um, <laughs> yeah, let's <like> just, <laughs> and no, it's practical, okay? The Holy Spirit works through the Word of God and He works through us. And, and that's how when we learn the Bible, we, we, we get a lot of help because he's in us and in the word of God. So when we're learning, we get help from the spirit. You see that? See how that works? And then when we open our mouth, we preach the word of God, which the Holy Spirit works through. Um, no legends because nobody, nobody I've ever talked to rightly devised the Bible. I've actually dealt with a lot of people that disagreed <laughs> Amen, this. No, guys. No. No, guys. No. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. There's there's a lot of things that I say a lot. I'm trying to break the habit of saying things too much like, okay, you guys. Okay, you guys. Okay, you guys. I say that a lot too. So I'm trying to put a stop to saying some things all the time. And you, you, you know another thing I say all the time? De Des, I think I say all the time. I also say... um here we go, or here, yeah, here we go, or I say, um, you guys ready? Are you ready? Oh, oh, who is it? Alan got me on that one. He, one day I was, I was like, are you guys ready? He's like, yeah, let's, let's do this. <laughs> I, I guess this is the blooper time for, for, for Brother Ed's uh, Bible scope here. Yeah, blooper time. Yeah, all the times, all, all the things that I say repetitiously, yeah. I try hard, guys. I try hard to make it interesting and and to draw people into the Word of God. Um, I, I know sometimes I'm not that 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 good at that stuff, but um, I'm trying really hard. 
Amen, legends. P appreciate the encouragement. Amen. Um, it's it's hard, guys. I mean, when people taught me the Bible, you know, when I was a new, new newly saved. <laughs> yeah. Amen. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I just see it as, you know, I, I'm so bored. I used to be so bored learning the Bible, guys. I'm so bored. I didn't want to learn it. And I, I, it, it was a struggle, guys. It was, it was a struggle with me. And I, I always said, you know, if, if, if there was ever a time when I got to preach the Bible, I'm going to try to make it as interesting as I can. I'm going to have, I'm going to have emotion. I'm going to have, come on, you know, like, bring it on. Like, come on, you guys got to understand this. You don't, you don't, you understand so much as this and, and just fluctuation of the voice and just try to, try to draw, you know. Amen, legends. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And, you know, guys, I, I've heard preaching. I mean, guys, I've heard. Look, I, I'll read Jer Jeremiah 34. This, this is the kind of stuff that, that I heard. I, I'm, I'll read, Jer look, uh, Jeremiah 34, verse 1. The Lord which came into Jer Jeremiah from the Lord when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army and all the kingdoms of the earth of his dominion and all the people fought against Jerusalem. Now, what we notice in Jeremiah 34, it's the word which came unto Jeremiah. And the word which came to Jeremiah was from the Lord. Are you serious? And I'm supposed to be drawn in. I'm supposed to be drawn into that. I'm like, wow, you know, just, 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 wow, it's not boring. <laughs> Guys, sometimes people that deliver the, the message can really do well by just, you know, not, I mean, finding some, finding some link into it for themselves. Like, hey, you know, this is exciting, man. I mean, I'm learning the word of God. I mean, this is, this is something, um, Yeah, yeah, right. Are are you serious? I mean, you're gonna read it like that? Come on, man. I mean, I, I mean, you want me to get involved, and you're not involved in it. <laughs> hey, man, Des. Um, yeah, legends, go ahead, go ahead, Des, or, or um, legends. Yeah, ask your ask your question. Um, I promote questions on here. I feel that way about babysit worship time. I feel that way about babysit worship time. Um, I don't understand that. Uh, explain that. You, you you feel that way about Baptist worship time? I, I I don't know. I don't know what kind of Baptist worship you have. I mean, what are you what do you guys do in a Baptist worship? Because we, I mean, Baptist churches are are obviously different from each other. Just like Pentecostal churches are different from each other. Hymns, old songs. Well, well, I'll explain that one to you, legends. Okay, yeah, legends. I'll explain that to you. And and like I said, I'm not I'm not trying to change anybody's mind. I mean, if you if you're convicted about it, you're convicted about. It. If you're not, you're not. But it's a you know it's a valid question. I mean, you're saying well. Yeah, understood, understood. But 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 here here's what I always go to. I always go to the old ways because the old ways aren't always bad, and um, the old ways actually have a lot more modesty and a lot more um, conservatism, or if that's even a word, um, in it. And when you're dealing with the old hymns, now, now you, what you notice is that don't, don't focus on, I mean, yeah, focus on the music because the musics are, are very um, modest. It's, it, I don't know if you can even describe a music as modest, but it is. Right, legends. And, 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 and the thing about that is um, training, training your mind in everything. And, and, I, and, and I'm just, I, I'm telling you how I did it, okay? It was... I, I, I used to listen to rap music and pop music and R&B. And then when, when I got saved, I started flipping it to Christian rap, Christian R&B, Christian, you know, this and that. Okay. That's what I started doing. 
as I started getting deeper and deeper and learning my Bible, I just started learning, and, and this is a personal conviction that I had, that not only was I supposed to change, right, Des, right, I, 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 was, I was looking at my life, and I was looking at, okay, I need to change this in my life. And, and it was about something practical that I do every day. And then I would change another thing and I change another thing because I was getting sermons preached and I started responding to them. And as I started getting deeper in my Bible, I started, I started analyzing everything about my life, about the words I speak, all the foul language that I used to have. So I started changing my language. And it took a long time, legends. I, I didn't change it overnight. It took a long time. My wife would help me. And every time I'd say, oh, my God, or oh, my goodness, she would jump right in. No, 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 no. You're not supposed to say that. I'm, I'm like, oh, oh, oops, oops. And I'd constantly try to correct myself. And then it kept going. It kept going. And I started doing more things. And I stopped watching, you know, Hollywood movies and this and that. And it, it was a step. I mean, it, it didn't come overnight. But I learned more and more and more and more and more. And what happened is it got to the music thing. Finally, when I got to the music, I was like, yeah, but I like this music, you know, and and then I and then I started hearing sermons preached about it. Like, okay, you know, when you're listening to this kind of music, what does it remind you of? And that, that was a valid point that was made to me. And I was like, well, when I listen to rap music, I think about all the times I used to break dance and do all the different things when I was lost. And um, you know the girls that I hooked up with and things like things of that nature in the in the in the world. And that's what the music was doing in my in my head, and I would always be reminded. And my flesh liked the beat. My flesh, it was all about my flesh. And and then and then one day the sermon was preached on the flesh versus the spirit in Romans chapter six and verse seven or, or chapter six seven and eight. And then I started thinking to myself, well, is this thing moving my flesh or should this should this music move my spirit? And, and it's, it's just some practical stuff. But again, you're, you're going to be persuaded concerning what you want to do anyways. But I'm just telling you how I got convicted of it. And it was just, I didn't really care for the old hymns, like nothing but the blood of Jesus and, and holy, holy, holy and, 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 and old hymn songs like that. But then as I started singing them more and more, I started realizing every time I sing these songs, it just reminds me of the Lord. It, the, the words they they glorify they have they have practical uh, biblical truths in them that glorify God. I mean, there there is no disdaining from glorying God in the words, and uh, that, and and I'm listening to the words as I'm as I'm getting more and more deeper and convicted about what music I should listen to. Then I started saying, well, you know what I'll do? Um, I'll kind of listen halfway to some of these songs, which is hymns. Right, legends. Right, and and that's that's kind of how I I was the same way, legends. I was just like that, and it, it was just kind of when the point was brought up, it just kind of moved me. I was just like, well, well, yeah, I want to I want to look into that a little bit more. I want to study that thing a little bit more because I want to be open minded. I mean, everything in my life I want to do to please God, so I may, you know I need to I need to hit this area because it's I'm really struggling with it. And so I was, I was listening halfway to hymns and then I'd still listen to like casting crowns and different things like that. And, you know, some Christian rock. And, and then, and then I'd, I'd flip back over to the hymns and I flipped and I kind of went into that phase for a little while. And then finally it was just like, one day it just clicked. I was just like, man, I, I, I just, I just don't want to be, when I stand before God, I don't want to, I don't want to stand before God having held back anything. And so that's, that's, that, that was my point. I'm not saying you guys have to do that. I'm saying that's my point. That's, that's how I got convicted of it. And, um, well, well, we're just de legends. We're dealing with great hymns of the faith. That's what you sing at church at a good old fashioned church that just preaches hymn, hymns right out of the hymn book. And uh, you can go online and you can type in the hymns and you can just hear like hymn singing. But again, it, it, it's going to take time, man. I mean, it's something it's, it's acquired for through listening over and over again, because you're like, I want to listen to things that glorify God and even the music, because sometimes the music can can interject, you know, kind of a, a flesh into it. 
But if you're doing with, if you're, I'm telling you this, and I'm trying to be honest, as, as transparent as I can be, without trying to be dogmatic, you know, because there's no verses for this, okay? Except you got your, your your verse that say, you know, sing in your heart spiritual songs and hymns, okay, unto the Lord. And, and you have verses like that. And so what I would do is I would just totally focus on something that's not going to remind me of the world. And something when I listen to it, it's going to remind me of something that's going to bring a truth of Jesus Christ and God. Yeah, and and uh, and again, legends. What what I do is I just stick with the the, the great hymns of the faith. Um, I don't know if I have one of those books. No, I, I don't. Here's here. This is our red book that we have in church, and and you know we have like. Uh, Songs that, um, and, and you go to table of contents, there's some songs in there. Um, yeah, I mean, if you, you, you couldn't really get dogmatic about like great hymns of the faith. You better listen to that or you, you know, you're sinning or whatever. I, I don't think you can go that far with that because people try to drive that one into the ditch too, you know, but I would just say, you know, if you're fully persuaded in your mind about your life, not, in, not being mixed with the world, then, then you would definitely have to consider that when you're dealing with music, you know. Right, right, legends, and 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 that's that's what it's going to be. And, and and if you you also know this side of the 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 I guess the uh, the argument or whatever you want to call it, you're not saying that all that other music is sinful. Yeah, I mean, like 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 when you get other music, yeah. It, it, it's kind of a preference, but but how, how about this one? Let, let me say it like this, Legends. Um, whatever preference you have, whether wh whoever's on here, whatever preference you have, why not let it be a preference that honors God in the Bible? That's 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 just my point, and and you can take it how it is or or not. I mean, I'm not dogmatic about it, but I would say whatever preference you have. Um, Try to line it up with the gospel. The Bible says only let your conversation be as it become the gospel of Christ. That's not your talking. That's your conduct. So, I mean, think about any kind of conduct you'd have in your life, whether it's music. Now, now if you think about music, music has a spirit to it. Sometimes music, when you listen to it, it makes you like hyped up, you know. Sometimes you listen to other music, it makes you sad. It makes you depressed. And music has a spirit to it. Amen, legends. Amen. So, so, so you know that music has a spirit to it, and it, and I mean, you can cheer people up with it. You can make people depressed. People can get sad. I mean, people can get teary eyed. And 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 legends. If you're familiar with with being Pente uh, in Pentecostal church, you know a lot of them use music to bring in the emotion as they're you know they're going through their services. They they make you they they, they dwell on emotion, and so they use music to do that. And so, but in our church. What we do is we just sing the spiritual hymns, and even though they may not move us in the flesh, I was in a Pentecostal worship man, and that's how they move the people. Right, legend. See, see, I'm preaching to the choir on that. Right, legend. See, see. So, 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 I'm not saying anything new to you about that. And so, the uh, the thing you got to think about is the music not moving the flesh. But the, but the music moving the spirit. And that's what hymns do for me. At first, they don't appeal to your flesh. They're like, yeah, I, I don't think I could get into this. I, I've never listened to this kind of stuff. But after a while, and, and you're going to church and you're saying, man, every time I hear these hymns, all I think about is, this is church, man. This is, this is Jesus. This is, and, and, and so I, I, I stuck with it and I kept, I, I sung with the brethren and we'd stay over and we'd sing songs and little by little through habit and just hearing the songs all the time I started liking them yeah KJ I, I agree you know singing psalms out of the Bible is good I mean they we have a we have a brother that's a missionary in our church that he he converts hymns or, or psalms in the in the book of Psalms to music which is pretty neat He's got he's got a couple CDs and a lot of our brothers you know they know they know those songs you know and everything so yeah I mean there, there's a lot of different ways that's why I'm not dogmatic about certain ways <laughs> yeah yeah legends but I mean I, I mean th think about the the great hymns of the faith because the great hymns of the faith they're they're I mean 
it, it started the biggest missionary movement in, in the world. As When the Gutenberg Press came out with the King James Bible, the very first book that was ever printed on the Gutenberg Press was the King James Bible. How about that? And then from that time on, you had the biggest missionary movement where you had these these artists, or I don't want to call them artists, but they're but the songwriters from from the great hymns of the faith were writing these songs, and they're they're more in the they're more in the uh, in the uh, the music field of folklore, like like folklore kind of a music. So when when somebody tries to say, well, you know. Certain types of music you can't listen to. Well, at the time, at that time in 16, you know, around 1611, that music was running rampant, kind of folk, folk, folk kind of music. So at, that was the kind of worldly music back then. So you couldn't really get into an argument if it's, well, folk music is the godliest music. You, you couldn't, that would be, that would be a meaningless argument because you could have an argument like that for anything then. So, um, so you can't argue that and you can't be dogmatic about that, but you, all you can do is suggest, say, when I think of this music, it, it reminds me of glorifying Christ. It's, it's, it, when I hear it, it's just sanctified music. It just, to me, it sounds sanctified music. It's really, I mean, you can get to a point where it's subjective, but at the same time, when you go into the Bible and you learn truths in the Bible and then you get on that music, it's like, wow, it's, it, it doesn't appeal to my flesh at all. It appeals solely to my spirit, and and I can I I can I can understand that in my spirit. And it takes a while for your flesh to catch up, but more habit, more habit, more habit. It's not going to be such a thing anymore. Of, of oh, I, I really can't stand it when you start getting accustomed to the hymns, like nothing but the blood of Jesus. And and it, and what I find is I find myself singing those hymns in my in my head because that's all I listen to now. I don't listen to anything else. And there's a lot of hymns. There's a whole lot of hymns in that book. So, I mean, whether it's in this all-American church hymnal, the red one or the blue one, um, I, I find myself singing them in my head all the time. And and that's just kind of where I go. And and guys, it, it, this, this is more of a subjective kind of thing. I don't have, you know, any Bible verses to go with that. But, I mean, you got principles. Principles. As if you're going to be persuaded in anything you want to do that's like this. Be persuaded concerning the Bible. Just say, look, if I'm going to choose something, I'm going to choose something that I know that's going to best honor God. And that's that's the kind of principles you just need to go to when you want to make any decision in your life and you don't have hard Bible to go with it, you know? Just just all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. So you, you, you can do all things, but not all things are good for you. And so you just want to do the things that are that are best for you that you know that you don't have a shadow of a doubt about and then just stick with that. And, and I, I think when you do that concerning the scriptures, you'll be all right. All right, guys. Wow. 1241. All right, legends. Yeah, you have a good night, too. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for um, bearing with me on the Periscope. It was a, it was a great night. Um, got to talk about some subjective things. But hopefully you, you see the heart and, and, and just... Whatever choice you make, do, do it to glorify God. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. He loves you. He did so many things he didn't have to do for us. Why don't we do some things that we don't really have to do for him? Amen. I think that's, I think that's a good trade-off. So, guys, um, thank you for listening to me. Thanks for the encouragement, guys. Thanks for listening in. Um, watch the replays. Look at the verses. Study them for yourself. And may the Lord richly bless you. And have a good evening and good night.